I would like to welcome everyone to today's ARC web conference on the use of health IT to improve care planning and communication with aging adults. Although a few people are still logging in, we are going to go ahead and get started on time. My name is Shaf el and I will be moderating this webinar. I currently serve as a program officer in the Division of Health Information Technology in ARC Center for Evidence and Practice Improvement. Before we get started, I need to go over a couple of housekeeping items and then we'll get right into the presentation. We will be recording this webinar and the recording will be available via ARC Health IT YouTube channel in about two weeks. Copies of the PowerPoint slides were emailed to each of you earlier this morning and were also available for download as you logged in today. We will also be sending the slides to participants via email following the webinar, along with information on collecting CE, CME credits if you need them. We are pleased to provide with us, we are pleased to have with us today an esteemed group of presenters. They include Dr. David Gustafson from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, Dr. Charles Safran from Harvard Medical School, Dr. Anita Mendoza from University of Wisconsin-Madison, and Dr. Kevin Ponto, also from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. This webinar event is accredited by Professional Education Service Group. For those of you who are interested in receiving continuing education credit for participating in this activity, information about how to claim your credit will be presented at the end of the presentation. For the purpose of accreditation, let me note that neither ARC nor AFIA, RTI, PESG, no, Dr. Mendoza, Dr. Ponto, or myself have any financial interest to disclose. Dr. Gustafson has disclosed that he owns stock in MCH Incorporated, is a principal of David Gustafson and Associates, and is a University of Wisconsin grant recipient. Dr. Safran has disclosed that he is on the board of directors at Intelligent Medical Objects is a consultant for Cerner and is a Foundation Council member for Health on Net Foundation. Additionally, no commercial support was received for the development of this learning activity. Just a brief note about questions. We have reserved time at the end of the presentations to address participant Questions. However, during the presentations, feel free to submit questions that you have for the presenters using the Q&A panel located at the right of the PowerPoint slide. As a reminder, participants in a listen-only mode, so to ask questions, you need to use the Q&A panel. Please also note that we will be showing two short videos today, the first of which includes an audio component. If you dialed in by telephone to listen to this webinar, you will not be able to hear the audio of this video. If you, are, if you are unable to listen through your computer, please note that a complete recording of this webinar will be available on the ARC website in about three weeks' time. By the end of the presentation, you should be able to Describe the impact of the web-based platform, specifically Elder Tree, that connects aging adults with family members, caregivers, and community resources on elder independence and quality of life. Describe the development of a family-centered web-based platform, also known as InfoSage, to improve communication coordination and collaboration related to health care decision-making and care transition for aging adults and their families and discuss the benefits of integrating 3D models of the home within the EHR to support care planning for aging adults. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our first presenter, Dr. Gustafson. Dr. David Gustafson directs the University of Wisconsin-Madison Center for Health Enhancement Systems Studies. His research interests focus on developing systems engineering tools and mobile technologies to support sustainable individual and organizational improvement. He has published over 270 peer-reviewed publications and seven books. 
Dr. Gustafson is a member of the National Academy of Engineering and the National Advisory Council for Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration. And now it is my pleasure to turn the controls over to Dr. Gustafson. Thank you, Shafa. My intent today is to describe Okay. My intent is to describe for you today a research study that we conducted in three counties in Wisconsin, one urban, one rural, and one suburban. The study was funded by the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality and we deeply appreciate those resources. Uh, what I'm gonna try to do is to describe to you a little bit about how we carried out our community-based participatory research, what we came up with as far as our technology, it's called Elder Tree, what differences we're finding between older adults and how they use the system, describe how we evaluated the system and what we're learning, talk about new developments and how we're going about disseminating the technology that we developed and evaluated. Our job in this particular research was to use community-based participatory research to keep older adults active and independent and to use technology to do that. Trying to get this thing to advance it, okay. Um, community, the asset-based community development approach was the one that we employed um, to do our community-based research. Uh, it's, a, it's a particular approach that involves focusing not only on the challenges that people uh, have, but the assets that they bring to it. It's one that tends to avoid institutional um, focus and really focus much more on associations by associations, I mean, uh, for instance, a card group that may be meeting at a church or things like that. You be begin by forming a strategy team in each community, and then you carry out interviews with um, community um, members using volunteers from that same community to better understand um, the situation in that, in that, in that setting. As we were doing our interviews, one of the things that we've, we found is that to some extent, uh, everybody wants to see uh, older adults stay at home, have fewer admissions, and improve their quality of life. Um, clinicians see this perspective in, in generalizing, which I shouldn't do. Uh, the clinicians see the approach would be to reduce falls and improve medication adherence and and deal more appropriately with the dementia and deal with depression. When we talked with our older adults, however, they said something very different. They said, we're lonely, we're isolated, we're in a community where there are events going on we'd like to participate in, but we don't know what they are, and even if we did, we couldn't get there. And so, of course, both are right. Uh, we tended to focus our research on addressing loneliness and isolation and falls prevention as the uh, things that we were going to try to tackle. Um, Clara stares out the window, not really seeing the dismal day. After her fall last month, she's a bit afraid to venture out, so she's got another long, lonely day ahead of her. It used to be not a day went by that she didn't have some activity. Scrabble at the library, friends to see, or volunteering at the senior center. Now it seems that people no longer call. They don't seem to need her anymore. She thinks of her late husband, Sam. They had such fun together, and their beautiful daughter, Tessa. Tess is worried about her, but Clara doesn't want to be a bother. Tess is so busy with her own family, and the fact is she's 84 and not getting younger. Sam is gone, and so are many of their friends. Her world seems so much smaller. You just don't know what a day will bring, and right now it's not looking so bright. At this point, Claire is introduced to ElderTree, a website designed to help older adults remain independent and engaged, mentally, physically, and socially. 
Clara has never used a computer, but the folks at the Senior Center urged her to give it a go and helped her get started. She also knows she can give a call if she has any questions. Right on the front page, she can see if there's anything new. There are always lots of discussions going on, and she likes reading them all, and it makes her feel less alone somehow. A fellow on Elder Tree, Joe, asked if anyone knew somewhere to play Scrabble. Clara wrote right back about a group that meets at the library every Tuesday. It felt good to reach out to someone new. Who knows, she may even head out to Scrabble soon and meet Joe in person. A few months later, Clara continues to find Elder Tree interesting and useful. The idea of going out isn't so scary now. Clara has been doing the balance exercises the Falls coach on Elder Tree suggested, and she's feeling much more steady on her feet. She's even back to serving lunch at the senior center. It's so nice to be involved again. The other day, Clara drove into town to do some errands. Typically, she would ask Tess, so she was happy to be able to take care of things herself. Tess had been worried about her driving for a while, so they sat down together and took a look at the driving information on Elder Tree. There were a lot of good reminders. They even mapped her route for her errands ahead of time. It gave Clara confidence and put Tess at ease. Even her health tracker on Elder Tree shows how much better she's feeling overall. Along with balance, she chose to track her mood and energy level. Right after her fall, both were so low. It's still day by day, yet for the most part, she's feeling really good these days. Oh look, there's a note from Tommy, her grandson. She knows Tess and the kids are so busy, but when she invited them to Elder Tree, they seemed happy to accept. It doesn't replace their phone calls or visits, but it's another way for them to stay in touch, and it means the world to Clara. She still misses Sam so, and some days are harder than others. She noticed there was some grief information on Elder Tree. It's good to know it's there. She certainly isn't the only one on Elder Tree with this on her mind, and it's nice to have others to talk to about these feelings. Clara stands on her front stoop, welcoming the new day. What's in store for today? She can't wait to find out. That, uh, the Elder Tree features that we have in the system were sort of described in the video. Uh, they break down into these six general areas, conversations, information, falls prevention, transportation, and, um, and a new area that we're beginning to develop now is a link out to clinicians. We'll talk a little bit about that later on. The system is having real trouble advancing uh, here for some reason. Um, as we developed this system, it became apparent that even for people who are really facile with computers, um, there, um, there are a lot of differences that occur as we age. Our hands begin to tremble, our coordination dis diminishes, and our eyes become dinner, dimmer. And as a result of that, we found that we that were a couple of things that we needed to uh, pay attention to. We needed a large screen. Uh, and with no mouse, so we used a touchscreen system uh, called a Chromebook. Uh, we needed to keep the material as simple as possible. The training that we had developed needed to be available anytime, and we needed to minimize our data collection. Uh, the system that we typically develop uh, for people with uh, addiction, for instance, uses a smartphone, but this was going to be uh, pretty impractical for us in in this situation, and as a result of that, our system looks a lot different for older adults. Uh, you can see here the the front page of of the system, and uh, and um, I think that that uh, gives you an idea of the relative simplicity. It might be important to note that uh, up at the top right hand corner, there's a button for training. What you get changes depending upon the slide that you're looking at. But in each one case, it's a video that teaches them about that particular slide, about that particular service, and how you can use it. So let's now go into the randomized trial that we use to evaluate the system. About 400 older adults were uh, recruited uh, for the trial, randomly assigned to either control or to elder tree. We had a, an equal number of people from urban, rural, and suburban communities and we surveyed them, gave them the, gave them Elder Tree, gave the uh, experimental group Elder Tree, 
and then collected data at 6, 12, and 18 months. Uh, primary outcomes, though, were really focused around the 12-month 12, 12 period. To be eligible for this particular study, you, you needed to be sort of in that uh, area where you're, you're getting to the point where uh, an admission to a nursing home might be uh, coming in the relatively near future, but you aren't right there quite yet. So you're in sort of a, a danger zone. And, um, and you can see on the screen here uh, the key criteria that we used for uh, selecting uh, people for the study. Um, we looked at a variety of things in the research. I'm going to mention uh, two of them uh, to you today. Um, one of them relates to uh, who are the people who use this system the most. And uh, in this particular uh, area, we, um, uh, we took 135 people, the first 135 people, and their use of the system over the first six months. During that period, there, there, you, you can do a lot of things, but one is posting messages to discussion group and private messaging. And uh, you can see there the number of uh, uh, messages that were, were posted in each uh, way, um, we broke down those, those people into four groups. Uh, one are people who didn't post at all, one are um, people who didn't write very much, and then uh, the other two were people who uh, posted a medium amount. And anybody who posted more than six messages a month were considered to be what we called super posters. Um, a couple of examples that came out that we thought were quite poignant. Uh, the first one was that 89% of the people who were super posters lived alone. Now that compares to roughly in the 50 percentile range for people who were not super posters. A second thing is that among the super posters, 67% of them had fallen in the last 12 months, compared to a much smaller percentage for the other um, uh, poster groups. Uh, we also found that about a third of them had trouble moving around the house versus a much smaller percentage for the other, for the other people. So we're talking here about people who use the system the most um, are people who uh, who were mo the most isolated, the most uh, fragile uh, of the group. And these are people who probably didn't get out much at all. Um, I'm going to skip over this particular slide except to say that 50% of the older adults in our population uh, have three or more chronic conditions. And it turns out that those are the people that seem to have the biggest impact uh, from uh, the technology. And uh, uh, if we look at everybody who was in the study, we didn't find any effect that was uh, significant. Some things approach significance, but there wasn't anything there. But when we looked at uh, a key moderator, and that was a number of primary care visits, we found that the people who tended to use the healthcare system the most were the people who tended to benefit. Uh, the most from from the system, and um, I'm going to show you that in two ways. One is to look at the statistical significance, but then also to look at uh, the the effect sizes. So you, you you can see that we're having a pretty good effect on quality of life, on uh, bonding and depression, on falls risk, and on um, uh, and and those kind of things. Driving the technology that we developed there didn't seem to have any, any uh, particular, uh, particular impact. Um, another way to look at that, though, is, is the effect sizes. And uh, here, the, the graphic that you see, uh, down the left-hand side, you see various combinations of chronic conditions. Uh, for instance, one is a, a combination of obesity, high blood pressure, and high lipids. Uh, our, then the next one is arthritis, blood pressure, and lipids, and so on. Uh, across the top are the columns, and here you see uh, uh, outcomes uh, presented again. Uh, quality of life, uh, support or bonding, as we called it in that other graph, 
uh, depression. And we've added two others, and that is the, the number of symptoms that people reported and the number of uh, health care services that uh, uh, the change in the amount of health care services they use. Uh, we anticipated that we would see real positive effects on quality of life, support, and depression. We never anticipated, because we didn't design this system, to have any impact on health care. But what we found was that people reported substantially fewer symptoms than they had reported in the past, or, for that matter, than the con that the control group uh, reported. And we also found a reduction compared to the control group in number of healthcare services. So we're quite positively uh, surprised in the fact that it looks like the system is not only having effects on quality of life and things related to it, but also in terms of healthcare utilization. Um, the dissemination is, uh, is the next area that we're going to uh, go into. Um, one of the things that we have done is to now move into uh, disseminating the system. The system is available throughout Wisconsin, but particularly they're available in, um, in 53 of the 72 counties. In those counties, we have now have community administrators. They might be a librarian. Uh, they might be a head of, a, of a, a, uh, a, a, an elderly center. Or they take on uh, different roles in different places. But in each one of those counties, there are people who encourage people to adopt elder tree, vet them to make sure they really are eligible for it, and uh, give them brief training and encouragement so they know how to get on, on the system. Uh, one of the best community administrative uh, groups that we have are, are people who are delivering um, uh, meals, on, meals on Wheels. We're moving in a couple of different directions in, in, for next steps on this project. One is that uh, we now have a new grant um, to uh, offer elder tree to older adults, only older adults with, with uh, multiple chronic conditions, at least six chronic conditions. We will collect, take the data that we collect from elder tree and share it with the clinical team at the time of appointment or if critical events occur. In addition, from a dissemination standpoint, we're working with uh, an, uh, a life insurer, home and life insurer called American Family, which is quite active in the Midwest. Their uh, American Family will be buying Chromebooks and hotspots for their, um, for their older adult uh, customers, giving it to them initially in Wisconsin and then in Illinois, Minnesota, and Iowa so that they can have access to the system. I should say that we don't allow any advertisement on Elder Tree, and, uh, and so while they're giving it to them, there's going to be some indirect advertisement, of course, but nothing on the system itself. Also, with uh, United Healthcare, uh, we have a grant out that will allow us to serve dual eligibles in Wisconsin, Ohio, Arizona, Texas, and Kansas, and so uh, we're optimistic that that uh, should uh, help us uh, in some positive ways. My last slide is just to touch on a couple of things that we've learned along the way. Um, the, our community-based participation, part participatory research could have gone better. Uh, it would have been um, really helpful had we done a better job of training our volunteers to, uh, on how they documented the results of their interviews. Uh, I wish that had been better. We still got a lot of good things out of it. Uh, focusing on assets can be very helpful in the sense of looking around at the community and, uh, and identifying uh, things in the community that people already have available and, and, uh, and point them out. We do that in, our, in the information section of the Elder Tree system. Uh, I think another mistake that we made was not um, not being uh, clearly uh, uh, in, clear in our understanding of the difference between community-based participatory 
work and, and um, research. Uh, the asset basis community development really takes you into a community and says they're in complete control of what kind of changes we're making. Uh, our grant was to use a technological solution to the problem, and so sometimes we got into some conflicts with uh, the uh, ABCD folks on, on that particular thing. It, it worked out fine, but if we have been if we've been more cognizant of the of the different agendas of those of our two uh, strategies, it would have been better. I think the deep understanding of the customer was essential. Every one of our computer uh, program staff volunteered at uh, at an elderly uh, at an elderly center uh, for about um, four months. I mean, for about three months just so that they could better understand uh, who they were serving. Um, it goes with the idea of not having a job but a calling, and we very much uh, appreciated the deep uh, dive that they took into better understanding the elderly folks before they started programming. I think it's going to be important to link to the healthcare care system. And finally, it's, I think that one of the key things that come out of this is you can provide people with information and support of all sorts, but the fundamental key that holds things together is communication. And, uh, and so when we call, talk about information and communication technologies, for us at least, it's the communication end and not the information end that drives the results that we got. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gustafson. As a reminder, we will be taking questions after the conclusion of all presentations. So please submit any questions you have for Dr. Gustafson using the Q&A panel. Let's move on to our second presentation of the webinar, which is led by Dr. Charles Safran. Dr. Charles Safran is a professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and chief of the Division of Clinical Informatics at Beth Israel Deacons Medical Center, where he has helped develop and deploy large institutional clinical computing systems, electronic health records, clinical decision support system to help patients with HIV AIDS, telehealth systems to support um, parents with premature infants, and most recently, e-health solutions for families with frail elders. Dr. Safran is a primary care physician who has helped transform healthcare through the creative use of communication and information technologies. In 2014, he was awarded the Morris F. Collin Award, the highest honor given to by the American College of Medical Informatics given to an individual whose personal commitment and dedication to biomedical informatics has made a lasting impression on healthcare and biomedicine. And now it is a pleasure to turn the control over to Dr. Safran. Hello, um, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, yeah, great. Hi, uh, I'm Charlie Safran. Um, uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. I'd like to thank the Agency for Healthcare Quality and Research, uh, for research and quality, both for um, allowing me to speak today, but more importantly, to having funded um, the ongoing work um, that I'll describe briefly today. Um, title of my talk is Leveraging Private Social Networks for the Care of Elderly, should be patients rather than parents, but, um, uh, and much of what I'll talk about today has um, uh, some aspects of what we've been doing have um, been discussed by uh, Dr. Gustafson, uh, who is an idol of mine, and um, I'm glad that uh, uh, my work won't uh, add to some of the things he talked about. Uh, so today we're going to recognize some of the unique challenges of care coordination for elders and their families, describe how clinical informatics can be used to improve communication, coordination, and collaboration in the care of elders, and discuss strategies for the use of smartphones in community-based care. Okay. 
So the slides are not advancing. There. So InfoSage provides families with a private social network to help them care for aging family members. And I, I might just say from the outset that when we talk about elders, we're talking about frail elders uh, and exclusively people over the age of 70, 75 or older. So being 76, I mean being 66 myself, I'm sort of thinking that doesn't seem like I'm an elder yet, uh, but um, I, I um, am classified as one. The InfoSage users comprise uh, a living laboratory to study family-centered tools designed to enhance care coordination and improve medication safety. Okay. Things a little slow and advancing. So I'm going to start at the end of the story um, and uh, show you a little bit of some of the results of our study before I describe more about what exactly InfoSage does. Um, so what we've represented here are a few of our interesting families. Um, we refer to the center of a care network, if you will, is a keystone. So this is typically a person over the age of 75, and to be admitted into our living laboratory, uh, we each keystone uh, has a proxy as well. So we admit into our living laboratory dyads of people. Um, so think of this as your elder parent, or in my case, an elder parent, and uh, the proxy is frequently a daughter who has been, uh, one or more daughters, who have been uh, involved in the care coordination, the support of the elder at home or in an assisted living situation. Caregivers, um, I'll talk about what these different role-based access allows you to look at in a, in a second, but think of a caregiver as being perhaps another family member, for instance, a son or son-in-law who might be involved in the care, uh, but um, uh, it doesn't have the same privileges as a keystone or proxy. And lastly, a uh, participant in the care. So you could think of that as being uh, perhaps a neighbor or a grandchild or um, someone else uh, um, who uh, uh, might, might be involved. So the larger the circle in this diagram, the more uh, activity they have in their own private social network. And you can see, just looking at these uh, uh, few chosen families, uh, that there are some very large green circles, um, which indicates that uh, there's a very active um, uh, user, uh, elder user of our system. Uh, but you see also some very large red circles, um, which indicates that um, these would be daughters or siblings, they could also be a spouse. Uh, so we're just beginning to explore what uh, the nature of both communications and the information needs are of these families. Uh, but um, families come as we might uh, all recognize in all shapes and sizes. I want to show you two families here as an example. So here's one. Um, that was in that previous diagram. It's a family with um, two keystones. Uh, there are four proxies and one caregiver. And although we're located in the metro Boston area, um, only one of the keystones lives in this greater Boston area. The other keystone uh, lives uh, about uh, I don't know, 20 miles outside of Boston. You can see that uh, the two keystones are connected through a caregiver and that one of the proxies of the second caregiver lives all the way in Portland, Oregon. 
So the way to perhaps think about um, this particular network, and we're limited as to what we can specifically know about a given care network, but we have a keystone, the larger green circle, with three proxies, perhaps three daughters, who are living in uh, the Boston metro area. Uh, there also, this keystone is connected to a uh, caregiver, which I'm interpreting as a uh, son-in-law of perhaps one of the uh, proxies, that this uh, keystone, this um, caregiver also has a parent who uh, they've invited into a network uh, who lives about uh, 10 or 20 miles outside of Boston, and uh, that uh, parent also has a a proxy, perhaps a daughter living in uh, Portland, Oregon, who is uh, involved in the care. So this is an example of one family. Looking at um, another family, here's a family that we discovered that lives uh, somewhat in the greater Los Angeles area. They were not recruited specifically by us into the study, but self-recruited online, so our app uh, InfoSage, which exists on the web and also uh, in the, on smartphone apps, is available worldwide. We have users from many countries around the world, but we also have many uh, people who have found out about InfoSage uh, through talks like the one I'm giving right now and try it and use it for their own family. So here's a family with two very active uh, Keystone elders. Uh, and both those keystones live in the same location in uh, the Los Angeles area. Uh, there is also, uh, again, uh, I don't mean to be sexist, there probably are some uh, male uh, proxies, but in uh, our experience and where we can know this, they tend to be daughters more than sons. Uh, but there uh, is a um, child, presumably, or a proxy living in the um, uh, Los Angeles area, as, as well as a, um, a caregiver who might be a son or might be a son-in-law. Uh, and then there are two other proxies that live far away, 350 miles away in Santa Clara, California, and uh, North Carolina. And so uh, one of the, you know, beliefs that uh, the, the team has, our research team has, is that you can't take care of a elder uh, without uh, involving the whole family. And so our technology is designed uh, to involve the family regardless of where they're living. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the problem we're trying to solve, talk about some early design issues, uh, some early findings, and some reflections. So aging creates healthcare decision-making, information management, communication challenges for elders and their families. In many instances, for a, uh, a child of an elder parent, this becomes a time-consuming, almost uh, half-time job for some families. Care coordination is accept exceptionally challenging uh, as the elder uh, moves from independence to perhaps more dependence back to uh, independence. And respecting the elders' preferences and priorities is often lost in the translation uh, from one setting to another. So I want to tell you just very briefly about a case. Um, a 94, AB is a 94-year-old uh, white female admitted in May of uh, 2015 with altered mental status, uh, status and failure to thrive. She's been followed by the geriatric practice. She goes there on a Friday afternoon. Of course, they're going to tell her to go to the emergency room, but she was noticed to be hypertensive and noticeably weaker than on previous visits. She had increasing fatigue for two weeks, decreased appetite, and difficulty walking. She had recurrent falls without any head strike. Uh, there was no abdominal pain or dysuria. She was a widow, is a widow, lives at home, has 24-7 care, her daughters are actively involved in her care. On admission to the hospital in the emergency room, you can see that she was on this uh, very long list of medications. I'm not going to read them, 
uh, you have copies of the slides. Needless to say, um, no, in my opinion, as an internist, uh, primary care doc, uh, I don't think anybody should be on 15 medications. But nevertheless, uh, she was. And uh, by the time she got home two months later, um, a month and a half later, no one actually knew what medication she should be on. Uh, when you called the hospital, there was a discharge medication list. Uh, there was an ambulatory medication list from before the hospital hospitalization. Uh, there was a uh, medication list supplied to the visiting nurses uh, from a two-week rehabilitation stay. And you could see the family was beside itself. They finally uh, made this um, a medication list. And if you look at the very first medication on the list, uh, it listed her thyroid medication as being 100 milligrams, uh, which would kill anybody uh, if they took that much Synthroid. Uh, it was a typographic error that uh, the family, as they were copying the medication list, and you could see as soon as they um, made this medication list, they started crossing things out as well. That's the state of medication lists, uh, and they're confusing for families. So the challenge is that there's poor communication, coordination, and collaboration in the care system in general. When you return home, community resources are, are fragmented. I think we heard that very nicely in uh, Dr. Gustafson's talk. Uh, there's a burden on children that can become a part-time job. Uh, cognitive and physical functions wax and wane in our population. And the demographics of elder care are creating a worldwide imperative. And, 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 you know, we talk about elders uh, conventionally as being over the age of 65, um, but the population over the seven, over 75 has a very different uh, use profile of technologies than do uh, younger uh, younger folks. Uh, they've um, had talked about eyesight and, and hand tremors as being part of the problem. Uh, the form factor of the phone uh, makes it almost impossible for people to see much of what's going on. You can see that the use of, of smartphones of people over the age of 75 uh, is quite small, despite the fact that there are uh, you know, billions of smartphones on the planet. Uh, they're not being used by elders, um, at least according to the Pew Research Center uh, a few years ago. Uh, Admittedly, uh, th these numbers increase over time. As 65-year-olds eventually become 75-year-olds, their behaviors will move with them, as were the 65-year-olds, 55-year-olds uh, before they retired. Uh, their use of computers at work was, was perhaps greater. So the challenge uh, for us was trying to decide who was the user in the family uh, was it the elder themselves, or was it uh, the baby boomer family members, or grandchildren? Who was it? And when you look at technology in general, I'm just showing uh, some pictures of, of remote controls for your TV for any of us who have tried to uh, put um, technology in your parents' home. I've given my parents uh, DVRs in the past. I've taken them back because they were never able to use them. You look at each one of these uh, remote controls, the buttons are in a different place. The same is true with every web page you're going to visit. There's rarely a button in the top right corner, as shown by Dr. Gustafson, that just sort of gives you the help information that you want. And God forbid you just want a telephone number to call. Where do you find that on a web page? So our challenge um, was both who was the user of our system as we built it out, how do we make it intuitive, uh, both for uh, the baby boomers who are the children and their parents. Uh, how do we build networks around Keystones? And we've published in the past some of the focus groups that we ran early on. I'm not going to talk about them, but uh, control of information and confidentiality uh, turns out to be uh, a large issue uh, for uh, our, our Keystones when we talk with them. And lastly, as I pointed out with the family in California, 
uh, our approach was to allow online recruitment into the clinical trial from anybody who could find out about our system. Uh, and uh, we did engage in some social media uh, advertising to try to reach uh, larger populations of folks into our system. So very briefly, uh, so anybody, anybody that's listening today, and there are 317 of you I see, uh, can uh, log on and sign up for InfoSage. It's InfoSageHealth.org. Uh, you can be a keystone, uh, or you can be a proxy for your parent uh, who is a keystone. Uh, so not all of our keys, some of our keystones, for instance, my mother-in-law, uh, never used a computer and doesn't, but the family uh, uses InfoSage by virtue of the fact that the daughters are proxies and the son-in-laws, like myself, are caregivers. The difference being the Keystone can do everything that's allowed uh, on InfoSage. They can invite proxies into, they can invite a daughter or a son to be a proxy. They can invite their spouse to be a proxy. The proxy has um, two abilities, um, uh, the Keystone and the Proxy have two abilities, one that no one else has. Uh, one, they can invite others to uh, the network. So for instance, well, you can invite a social worker into your network, you can invite your physician into the network or any family member or neighbor. You can give them a role as a caregiver or a participant. Uh, caregivers can see medications. So when I started this project five years ago, I guess I could have known or should have known that uh, sexually transmitted diseases were rampant in some assisted living uh, settings. Certainly the use of Viagra or Cialis among some of the male uh, residents um, in some of these settings is uh, prominent. And uh, there may be some sensitivity to sharing that kind of information. Um, so not everybody um, uh, necessarily needs to see medication information, and I'll show you in a second that uh, specific medications can be hidden even from, from caregivers. There's a to-do list, uh, there's a task list, and then there's a, a, a communication blog uh, like shown with Dr. Gustafson. So here's what uh, that medication looked like before InfoSage, and here's what it looks like now on an iPhone. Uh, there's a, um, uh, this is a, uh, you see three panels from the iPhone. Uh, it works on an Android device as well. Um, there's the medications. You can see specific, in the second panel you can see information, more information about that um, particular medication. So probably, the Talipram, uh, um, you can see the name, the medication, the dose, uh, the frequency. Uh, you can choose to share this information, it's active or inactive. If you press the little I button in a circle, little blue button, uh, you get into the full Medline Plus and you can see the patient education monograph provided by the National Library of Medicine. I should mention that the underlying medication database is from the National Library of Medicine called Rx Norm, as are in the last panel the drug-drug interactions that the family can look at. You can email this to your physician or in the emergency room, you could print it out if there was an active printer nearby. And we're actively working right now on a fire interface uh, for InfoSage so that we can both get medication lists out of electronic health records and then send them back to uh, commercial system so that they can do uh, medication reconciliation uh, when a patient is uh, admitted. We believe that with family participation, the inclusion of um, over-the-counter medications as well as herbals on our medication list, that our medication list might be uh, more accurate than uh, is usually stored in an electronic health record. So a little bit about use. Um, you can see uh, there's a map of the United States on the left, or the right side of this um, slide uh, indicating that uh, Massachusetts is obviously where the most heavy use of InfoSage occurs. But we can see our families live all over the United States. Um, so we've had, uh, we're, we're tracking among our study participants. Now there are other people in our 
our networks who can sign up for InfoSage who aren't in our study network. So this is restricting to our study participants. Um, you can see that there have been 1,700 total um, sessions. Uh, users, um, uh, to the best of our ability, they can. Uh, we're using IP location to identify a unique user, so this slightly overcounts unique users. But what we do know accurately, and I'll draw your attention to the second, uh, the third, and four, or the last two columns, pages and duration that um, uh, on average for a session, people look at uh, uh, six uh, web pages um, uh, past the sign-on page and have an average duration of about five minutes per session uh, that they're using InfraSage. Uh, you can see in Massachusetts, with the exception of uh, Wisconsin, uh, which is also a, a heavy user, probably as a result of a talk I gave uh, at the University of Wisconsin, um, uh, that uh, the Massachusetts users are, as we might expect, the heaviest users, but they're a significant use uh, in uh, quite a few states as well. So some key observations um, as I sort of wrap up here, um, and that is that uh, elders and their families in the study were able to use advanced technologies to create an online network, add medications, and use messaging. Uh, family networks have formed that include spouses, children, grandchildren, and caregivers. Enrolled families are geographically spread out, remain, uh, ranging from uh, the catchment areas around Boston that we sort of expect families to live in sort of eastern and uh, southern Massachusetts, but really it spreads out all the way across the country that our, uh, our, our children of uh, the elders live in New York City and Florida and uh, wherever you might think um, uh, families spread out to in LA. Uh, our results show promising opportunities for more advanced online care coordination for elders and their families. So in summary, InfoSage is a private social network for family-based and community-centric care. Families are geographically dispersed. And while designed to support the care of frail elders, uh, InfoSage works for loved ones that have diabetes, cancer, or other high-impact chronic illnesses. So I'm going to thank my team, uh, including uh, Warner Slack, who uh, is the um, sitting in the front row there. He's um, 84 years old. He comes into the office every day. He's one of our uh, uh, InfoSage users uh, and has been an inspiration for the kind of work that we're doing along with the rest of the team here. I want to again thank the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality for supporting our work and invite anybody uh, who wants to to use InfoSage. Uh, it's available for free and worldwide. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, Dr. Safran. Let's move on to our third and last presentation of this webinar, which is being led by Dr. Anita Mendoza and Dr. Kevin Ponto from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. All right, thank you so much. Um, just get this going. So, what we're going to do for this presentation is we have two of us presenting. Um, I'm going to take the first half of this presentation and just give a little bit of background on this project, and I'm going to hand it off and you'll hear more about um, the outcomes of this particular project. So our goal of this work was to design better tools for discharge planning. And part of this work came out of um, some work from a number of years back from uh, Patty Brennan, and she had done a project called Project Health Design in which they had looked at putting technology in the home environment. And as they went to do this, they realized we don't really know that much about the context of the home environment. Oftentimes when we think about health and healthcare, we think about uh, environments such as a hospital, which are clean and well-organized, and what we found is that the home environment is oftentimes very cluttered and uh, chaotic. 
And so um, utilizing another uh, grant from the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, there's an R01 in which we um, created called the VizHome Project. And the goal of this project was to utilize virtual reality technologies to try to simulate the home environment. And what we found as we started this project is that computer-generated versions of virtual reality environments didn't really uh, contain that clutter and chaos of a real home environment. They oftentimes looked very cartoonish, as you can see in this photo. And so what we did in this project was we used 3D capture technology. So we used a technology called LiDAR. Um, this is something that's used in surveys in which people go out and they do 3D scans of environments. And so we used this technology and we were able to bring these types of scans uh, into virtual reality. And we could bring these into uh, our cave environment, we could expose participants to them, and they could see these home environments with all the clutter and chaos. Um, and we could run lots of people through, we could run people through who might not be able to go to different types of homes. And we've actually found this uh, technique to be useful in a number of different applications. So we currently have funded research projects in which we're using this, this methodology for crime scene investigations, we're using it for purposes of cultural heritage and outreach, and um, what we'll talk about today is using this type of technology for the purposes of discharge planning. So with that, I am going to hand this off. Um. Good afternoon, Walt. It's a, my pleasure to be here, uh, and we thank uh, the agents uh, for healthcare research and quality for the invitation for supporting our work. As uh, Dr. Ponto was mentioning, uh, this work starts previously uh, when uh, Dr. Brennan and her group, uh, including Dr. Kevin Ponto, started looking into homes. Uh, it came came the idea of uh, creating what is this project is going to show you, it's also funded by HRQ called Virtualized Homes or the way uh, we commonly call it the Home 3D. So uh, the Home 3D builds upon all these tools and methodologies that um, Kevin mentioned before and, and they were developed to capture the home environments and, uh, and the idea for this new project was to then development implementation that where we would be able to use these images, annotate them, and perhaps doing that uh, in the context uh, of clinical care. Um, in doing so, one of the ideas would be that these uh, uh, images or this actually uh, videos could be used in the context of the uh, electronic health records, really at the point of care. So with proper uh, security and protection of the data, these models could be available uh, for uh, clinical care and as well as uh, research uh, linked to uh, the patient's electronic health record. So why doing that? What was the motivation regarding to that? So as private homes are fast becoming critical locations for self-care, and we saw that it, the both two previous presentations where the family is engaged uh, and uh, the care is mostly done at the home environment, um, home visits sometimes can be very intrusive and costly. And at the best, uh, they can use sometimes uh, text descriptions or simple images of uh, that could lack precision for some of the care. So also at a hospital level when patients are seen with some problems and we'd see for instance an elderly with difficult to walk in or the use of a walker or a cane uh, that is being discharged, they sometimes cannot really report with uh, accuracy or they don't recall uh, how their home environment are. So it doesn't reflect uh, some of the, the key points uh, that simply, that this space uh, that is required. So this sort of like an oversimplification of what uh, they have uh, at home. Oops, sorry, that's one more. So uh, when you look displaying this uh, kinds of models uh, at the, in the electronic health records, making them accessible to healthcare providers, 
could perhaps uh, help in a systematic assessment of this home environment so that researchers or and clinicians could, could uh, safely uh, look into the environment, try to look at this reconstruction and tailor care instructions specific to the space that the patients have. So this model could be linked to the HR, enabling this uh, exploratory uh, view of this relationship between the healthcare and the homes in that. So in this uh, slide, what you see now is the extension of the VS Home project that Kevin showed to provide access to uh, this uh, capture image and a point cloud data to healthcare professionals to the HR implementation. So the homes are uh, videotaped, so this system is virtual, virtualized in a 3D uh, imaging, stored uh, uh, in the HR records and made available for clinical decision making and, 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 and also be available later for clinical outcomes uh, research and, and quality uh, as well. So uh, our aim was really to, in this project, to successfully implement this workflow that you are seeing now and the technology as a proof of concept for this kind of uh, approach. So to our knowledge so far, there was no really formalized way of doing all this capture and storage and annotation in this environment uh, connected to the HR records, and we wanted to pilot and try to successfully put this in place. So uh, the next slide, uh, what is showing here is actually the data flow uh, that happens in this project. So from the, the 3D scans that you see on your left side from the Viz Home project, we use similar scanning process. Uh, the images are then uh, put in the uh, a 3D point cloud data, and the and we allow for uh, textual metadata to describe the home environment. So what this metadata would be, metadata would be like distance between chairs or uh, how many ta tables in the environment. So all the images are mapped and we will show at the end uh, a video that would show you uh, some of this uh, uh, components of this too. So the metadata was based on the uh, Getty Arch and Expector Thesaurus, so a standard terminology which enables to describe the environment as well the objectives ob objects in it, and uh, it's formed by which in this vocabulary is uh, is formed uh, by uh, structural ways of uh, of showing this architecture uh, uh, and 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 objects in this environment. So, for instance, we could describe that this is a chair of type X, or we could describe this is a table that's lower, that's higher, uh, and things uh, that are built in the environment that patients may use for, for uh, doing their care. So the next slide, uh, what you're showing here is basically uh, the HR integration, the electronic health records integration. So the slide intends to demonstrate how the flow in the integration with the electronic records would be uh, for uh, the caregivers that would use this tool. It's primarily um, the output, initial output, where they can view uh, this interaction, uh, and you will see a viewer of that goes into the, the image, it goes 3D, the image can be moved, it can be uh, uh, turned, can be uh, increased, decreased, uh, and, and the healthcare uh, provider could actually annotate into the image keep the record uh, and then save for future use and annotation in the HR. This could be also printed to give to a patient or printed to, uh, to uh, place in a chart or give to a physiotherapist or a healthcare provider that would do, uh, would do the, the following care for this patient. So <clears throat> in, throughout the, the process of this project, we have uh, we learned several lessons regarding to this kind of implementation and to how this could be really uh, related to DHR. And one of the things that, uh, that we learned is that it was essential uh, to have the support of the healthcare system, of course, and the HR vendor to do this kind of work. This, should be, this kind of image should be linked to the ARF and there should be a way for us to send the information back to the electronic health record. And we were fortunate to be able to work with uh, UW Health, which is our uh, institution, 
as well as Epic System, who is the vendor who has uh, uh, our electronic health records uh, to resolve some of the technical challenges and demonstrate the feasibility of linking these images uh, to the EHR. We also were fortunate to be able to work with uh, clinicians to identify system requirements. Uh, one of the most uh, important things we wanted to learn with this project was if this would be something uh, that that uh, providers would want to use, and as well if it would be something that patients actually uh, would think would be uh, interesting and would affect that. So uh, in order to assess some of these uh, questions, we did work with healthcare providers and we conducted a, a series of focus groups with healthcare professionals to help us guide, guide us in determining uh, when in the clinical workflow, exploring and annotating these kinds of patient home images through the home 3D uh, uh, process would add insights and provide a platform for the care planning. We learned from these professionals that the tool, for instance, could be ex uh, extremely helpful, especially in discharge planning and family education. Discharge planning uh, instructions uh, could be really explicitly tailored to the features of each patient home. Uh, what you see in the screen is, um, is one of the, uh, it's part of what we, uh, the census at our focus groups, what one of the uh, physiotherapists mentioned to us. And the important thing here is that a lot of the times the patient may get sent home, for instance, with a walker, or if I can, and in the case that, that is described in the screen, you would see that the patient was sent home to with a walker, but the walker would be parked outside the home because the door doesn't have the right side, so the walker does not pass the home, or the wheelchair does not pass the door entry. So maybe it would be important for the, the physiotherapists and the nurses to know that in advance so they can train the patient in a different way, perhaps practicing with canes or or doing some other work uh, right up front end. So there is uh, healthcare providers who plan in hospitals and out of uh, hospital care activities better at this point, instead of having to go to the home and then suddenly they cannot do the work they are supposed to do because the home environment does not really represent what the patient had told them in, uh, up front uh, at, the, at the hospital level or the home care level. So um, I have in the, the next slide another comment, uh, more towards uh, patient education at this time, where the, the providers that, looking, that discussed uh, with us felt that they might be helpful education keys to stick a bit more. So uh, as Dr. Safra mentioned, having a place where this information is stored, where you can print it out, bring with you to your position, or be reminded of how to do things or where to do things could be helpful for, for the patients at any level. So our tool does really not focus only on elderly population, but we know that um, elderly population have higher risk for fall and, and other uh, injuries that could perhaps be helpful for this kind of, uh, of the environment. So we are also very interested in the patient's perspective and we'll be soon conducting focus groups with the patients some of the hopes that we have is that the patient can provide us input on the feasibility, desirability, and privacy concerns, especially uh, of, of, um, of really relocating their home, for instance. The VIS Home Project has shown uh, uh, that this is feasible uh, in some ways to, to get images from home first, but we wanted to know their perspective in all, all also using looking at this uh, at the point of care. So, I will pass back the, uh, to Dr. Kevin Ponton at this point. Uh, before, I just would like to, uh, to demonstrate a video for you where he's gonna talk over this process. I know a lot of the technology can sound uh, uh, too heavy, so I want him, we wanted to show you a little bit of all this work. And uh, I would like to, before doing that, thank uh, our collaborators. This is a project that, you know, it's done with the collaboration of their person, as Dr. Ponto mentioned, Dr. Patty, Patricia Brenner was one of the initiators of this project, as well as Dr. Marcos Broker. Uh, we also want to thank Gail Cosper, Ross Ferdinick, who are 
part of the uh, Living Environment Lab uh, and uh, our EW House uh, uh, collaborator, especially Jocelyn Dewitt and Shannon Dean, who are the CIO and CMIOs of the institution and the EPIC system. So Kevin, uh, I think uh, I'm gonna move that to you again. Yep, sounds good. So we thought we'd just have a video to kind of demonstrate how this looks in practice. So again, um, some of the project background, um, we're using 3D scanning technology. So um, this is what our scanner looks like. Uh, we can go around, we can place it in home environments and create these 3D models. So this is now a depiction of a house which we captured in the VizHome project. Um, you can see the amount of detail that is captured through this 3D scanning um, process. And um, again, in the VizHome project, our goal was really to look at these in virtual reality. So here we have a, a virtual reality environment and we have a user moving through. We've also been now working to try to put these in consumer grade virtual reality uh, equipment. So this is a view of a house inside one of these um, consumer grade VR devices. And you can see the person can look around and uh, see the home. So for this project, we really wanted to move out of virtual reality and try to create a system which would work on a web browser. So a web browser doesn't have quite the um, horsepower as uh, maybe a, a VR system, but uh, it can still do a lot. So you can see here we have a 3D model of uh, an apartment and you can move around, you can change your viewpoint. And in this use case, we've had annotations. So people have pointed out things like trip hazards. But for the project, we also wanted to make it so people could create new annotations. And so to do this, we had this 3D view, the user could move around, they could change their viewpoint. And when they're happy with their viewpoint, then they could save it. And this just turns into an image. And once they have these images, they can go and they can start marking them up. So in this case, you can see the users marking up a bunch of chairs. Um, here they notice that the burner um, is on on the stove, so they're gonna change the color, they're gonna highlight that. And then as with other image annotation devices, they can draw arrows and they can also uh, leave notes. So here they're gonna create text and they can write notes on these. Um, and what's great is that we can put these directly in the EHR and we really think there's a lot of power and utility in this kind of methodology and approach. Thank you, Dr. Mendoza and Dr. Ponto, and thank you again to all our presenters for these very informative presentations. As a reminder, please submit any questions you have uh, for any of our presenters using the Q&A panel. This concludes the content uh, portion of the webinar. Now we have a few minutes left for questions. You can type them um, in the Q&A sections of the WebEx portal. You may not, we may not be able to get to all of them, uh, but we will um, answer them all in, written, in writing and send them um, the answers out to all attendees. And the first question that I have that came through the panel is uh, for Dr. Gustafson. When will the Elder Tree um, be avail system be available on Smart Four platforms? Um, we don't have a plan for making it available on a smartphone. Um, the the reason is that uh, we feel that for, and this relates to a later on question that we got. Uh, you know, we're we're dealing with populations up to ages of 103 in our study, and uh, and for these people uh, that we're aiming at, uh, the smartphone panel just uh, doesn't uh, doesn't do the job. So I think what we're going to be continuing to do is to work through uh, systems like uh, the um, smartphones with touch screens like the Chromebook. Thank you, Dr. Gustafson. Dr. Um, Safran, we have another question for you. Um, do you limit the participants to be located in U.S. Um, only or international as well? How global are your plans? To our surprise, um, when we put the smartphone app in the Apple Store and in the Android Store, we began to detect um, 
users from around the world. Um, not unsurprisingly, anything associated with our hospital is frequently um, uh, explored by hackers from China and Russia uh, in particular, but we have um, usage um, from every continent but um, uh, Antarctica. Um, and it's free uh, to use and, again, um, uh, supports any um, illness, uh, cancer, diabetes, uh, and the like, uh, although it's designed for, it was designed for, for elder care. Thank you, Dr. Safran. And I also have a question for um, Dr. Mendoza and uh, Dr. Ponto. Uh, what are the privacy issues to take uh, photos of the home environment? So, Mark, can I start with that and Kevin, please uh, feel free to uh, jump in <laughs> as sure. well. I think there are several um, uh, considerations we need to do. One is that really the picking this home environment can bring a lot of um, uh, details from the homes and may um, bring implications on, on regulations, uh, privacy regulations, potential self-incrimination, for instance. Uh, this data could show, uh, for instance, some illegal activity or some family practice that have a different uh, reportable, um, you know, for reportable behaviors. Uh, and the visits to the home can, when, when, the, um, when our, the teams are really scanning that, they may, uh, may, they may see things that are not uh, legal. They may think that behavior like child neglect or abuse or, or or for the elderly neglect uh, and things like that. There's also, I believe, uh, some issues regarding, for instance, ensuring company, companies interested in on that, on, on some of what's happening in their home. And maybe patients don't want to show us or people don't want to show uh, what they have at home uh, that could implicate in something that they want to disclose. So I think there are several risks. We, we wanted to really uh, we hope that in the focus group with the patients, we can actually learn some of those things uh, in a better way. So a lot of this um, you know, privacy concerns we have and we see are, are based on literature and our perception uh, of, of uh, what patients would believe as privacy. But based on previous studies, we know that um, some of them may not be completely true as what we perceive, but we would like to learn what they perceive as well. Uh, Kevin, do we want to comment a little bit on your experience with the Viz Home true. project? True, yeah. The, the one thing I will add, so for Viz Home project, the homes that we've captured, we will distribute publicly at the end of the project. And so we were very concerned about privacy issues. So we had all of the participants whose homes we went into actually mark up areas in which they uh, had concerns. So these might have been photographs, pieces of paper with identifiable information, um, other things that they felt were unique in the home that they would not want general people to know about. And we went through and we uh, went through a redaction process where we basically either removed um, all of that information or we would uh, more or less blur it out to the point of, of it, you know, you could, you could tell that it would be a photograph, but you couldn't tell who in the world the photograph was of. So uh, th this has been one of the things that we've been thinking a lot about as these capture technologies can really capture a lot of information very rapidly. And there's also the perspective of the storage of the data being a point of cloud as we are using that this data would be secured as well. So there's the, the more computational side, the more uh, IT side, I would say, in terms of keeping the same, uh, uh, the same safety and precautions that we would do with electronic health data, including uh, HIPAA uh, compliance. Thank you again. Um, Dr. Gustafson, I have another question for you. Um, it says, uh, thinking about patient-centered um, care, is the system available in other languages other than English? The system is not available in, in another language. We, are, we have uh, Spanish-speaking versions 
of a couple of our programs, but they're in areas such as breast cancer and, um, and substance abuse. Uh, in this particular arena, we're early on in that, and we certainly do want to convert, um, but it hasn't happened so far. Thank you very much. And um, Dr. Safran, I have another question. Um, did your research look at dual, el uh, dual eligibility status? No, we did not. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Mendoza and Dr. Ponto, um, they, there's another question in the, in the system that asks regarding costs around um, 3D scanners and equipment. So what would the cost be uh, for the equipment around? Kevin, I sure, think I, I'll I, let you answer that. Yep, I, I'll take that one. So currently the, the scanner that we are using um, is, is somewhat expensive and it costs about $40,000. However, there are um, cheaper versions, so we're working with law enforcement who have um, versions which are more in the $3,000 range. And we've uh, also utilized camera-based methods, so you just use a simple camera and take photographs and try to do reconstructions. So um, while the technology is currently rather expensive, also if you follow lots of patents, it looks like very soon we're gonna have this technology available on our cell phones and we'll be able to walk around homes and capture these kind of data sets. Um, so while cost is, is definitely still an issue today, we think in the near future it, it may um, be significantly less of an issue. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Safran, I have a, a couple of questions for you. So, a participant stated, in addition to medication lists, uh, what functionality is currently available to family members? And the second question is, is information availability differentiated for caregivers as compared to family members? So, in addition to medication lists, there's a, um, a section on a patient profile trying to elicit uh, both something about the individual, their family, their hobbies, who they are as a person, um, sort of a more comprehensive look at their uh, you know, preferences so when they're admitted into the hospital in the middle of the night, uh, people can get to know something about them. There may be uh, uh, photo albums that they can upload, pictures of themselves or their family or their selves at other times. There's a to-do list. One of the challenges for um, children taking care of their parents, there's usually one person who's sort of in charge and her challenge is to get any of her siblings or anybody else to do anything. Um, and so there's a to-do list, there's a calendar of events and things that need to be attended to. There's a, a micro blog so you can communicate with your siblings. And then we spent a lot of time, it's not heavily used, but we spent a lot of time trying to organize community resources. I think that's something that Dr. Gustafson talked about. Where are those bingo games? How do you get meals on wheels? And so we've curated um, with the help of the Health on the Net Foundation um, uh, to identify worldwide websites um, that uh, deal with issues of aging. And then we've had our own Division of Aging uh, both nominate and uh, go through websites for undue commercial influence and uh, the correctness of the content. Um, but we have curated content, so we have a modified Google search uh, which are geotagged to the location of the keystone so that you can get relevant uh, information about this. Um, there's a really good um, little introductory web um, video uh, on the landing page for anybody that sort of wants to see some of these um, uh, features demonstrated. In terms of what people can look at and what they can't look at, um, Although it's possible in role-based authentication, such as we have, to restrict any particular uh, option, we've chosen to only provide that feature for medications. So 
the Keystone or the proxy can choose to suppress any particular medication that they don't want to share with anybody. Um, but in general, um, uh, you know, people that are participants can't see the medication list, um, and people that are caregivers can see the medication list, but they can't uh, assign tasks to people. Keystones and proxies can assign tasks on the to-do list to others. So that's the, the extent um, of our you know, censoring or suppressing. One other thing I just might add is that when you build a website or a feature in healthcare based on what you can't do, um, it's a challenge uh, to get that disseminated. What, what the problem in healthcare is trying to uh, spread information, share information, rather than suppress it. So in focus groups in general, while privacy is a huge concern of elders and basically their autonomy being taken away and some paranoia about um, uh, untoward things people want to do on the web uh, uh, to people, in general, the, the problem that we face is, as clinicians and, and as children of parents um, is that there's not enough information being shared. So our, our, our baseline preference is to share things and make it a little bit harder to suppress the information that's not shared. We have reached um, the end. Thank you, Dr. Um, Safran. We have reached the end of our time for this webinar. Thank you all for attending. For those interested in obtaining continuing education credit for participating in this webinar, please visit the URL shown on this slide. You will select today's webinar, which will be indicated by a date and title, and then complete a brief evaluation of the event to claim your credit. You will have approximately six weeks to claim your credit for participating in this webinar. Upon exiting today's webinar, ARC is also fielding a brief evaluation, and we hope that you will complete this survey to share your feedback with us. Thank you all very much for participating in um, this webinar today.